Next curve. Hey, welcome to this Next Curve Rethink podcast episode where we will recap RSA Conference 2024. And I'm Leonard Lee, Executive Analyst at Next Curve, joined by the illustrious Roy Chua of Avid Think. And uh, welcome, Roy. It's great to have you on again. And uh, it was good to see you in, um, where was that? <laughs> Was it, was it Moscone in, uh, Center. Yeah, Moscone Center in San Francisco. I know. All, all I know. these venues are, you know, I, my default oh. has become Las Vegas, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. I, I've been in Vegas. I've God knows how many times already this right. year. So. Oh, yeah. you. I mean, you too. You've been you've been to Paris. God I have been to Paris time. twice. I know. <laughs> I know. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, before we get started, remember to like, share, and comment on this episode and subscribe to the Rethink Podcast here on YouTube and on Buzzsprout. Take us on the road and on your jog, on your favorite podcast platform. You can find us there. So, uh, Roy, let's get started here and really quickly i, I just want to outline what we're going to talk about number one we're just going to talk about what we saw was new our impressions of rsa conference 2024 then we'll talk about some of our key takes you know and um uh, roy will share his i'll share some of mine i'm sure there's going to be some intersects and then we'll cap things off with what are some of the things that we want you know technology and business leaders to pay attention to and and you know based on the things that we walked away with at this year's conference so um with that and um, looks like man it, it was a pretty packed venue um mm -hmm. You know, it's my first time there in person. I usually participate virtually because this, you know, in prior years wasn't exactly a priority industry uh, event for me. But man, yeah, I'm telling you, it's on the list now. Um, I had a great time, learned a lot. But 41,000 plus attendees, according to RSA um, conference, and there were like 650 speakers across 425 sessions and there were four over 400 media members 600 exhibitors on the expo floor and that's according to yes i am reading off of their little <laughs> press release so um yep. but man yeah what did you think um well i thought it was it was a good conference i'm glad to see that there is still a lot of interest in cybersecurity, as there should be um given yes. what's happening in the world um i've been going to rsa for yeah, 20 odd years now i guess yes. uh, since very early because i used to be in networking security i guess mm -hmm. i'm still in networking security <laughs> somehow um yeah but regardless, i thought it was a good conference i thought there was a lot of energy a lot of um folks on the floor uh you know i usually like to see and walk around and check out people's booths and i picked up some photos of i always take photos of neat and nice and cute booths actually which is which is <laughs> kind of stupid but i i mean i thought you know some booths are just gigantic and yeah. then some booths have interesting uh, stuff in there so i, I usually yeah. do that anyway for fun and it's always nice to catch up with people like there are people i haven't yeah. seen for over a year and that's where you get to see them at the rsa conference so i thought it was yeah. good um i think you know a couple of things that i i know sort of when you see people on the show floor, there's a few conversation starters and everyone goes with, did you see, you know, Palo Alto Networks does not have a booth, right? They don't, have, they're not on the show yeah. floor, you know, they're in hotel yeah. nearby. And yeah, right. People are always talking about that, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, interesting um, strategy. Right? Yeah. That, that, well, I, I think uh, it's kind of a post-pandemic thing right uh, or actually yeah because uh, a lot of the events i mean i'll i'll pick on ces for a moment uh mm -hmm. ces was just coming back online after the pandemic i think a lot of vendors uh had a bad experience right a lot of exhibitors had a bad experience and you know it's not cheap to get booth space at these uh these uh, conferences and mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. you know industry events so um yeah i think they they're they're still coming out of that 
shell shock situation. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess objectives change the way that people engage uh, with their customers and uh, the way that customers engage with vendors might have changed a bit. But uh, I don't know. Overall, it, it looked like there were there were plenty yeah. of uh, folks out there, exhibitors out there, brands out there. Yeah. Actually, oh, yeah. kind of overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they did. It was, I mean, whether or not Palo Alto was on the show floor or nearby, there was a lot of other vendors happy to take their, you know, take their spot and and yeah. take all the audience. And yeah, the, I, I I spoke to a couple of sponsors, you know, and exhibitors. They were pretty happy with the traffic. They were yeah. uh, satisfied that they were getting at yeah. least their money's worth, whatever that means. But yeah, but yeah, I think you know a couple of other things that people were talking about. Certainly, you know the. Uh, couple of highlights were like WIS with the billion dollar in funding at $12 billion valuation. Everyone was like, my God, it's only a four-year-old company. You know, how did that yeah. get that so quickly? Um, you know, certainly just points to there is still, there's, there's faultiness not just in AI, but there's faultiness in in security. Now, of course, WIS talking yeah. about it. Everyone talks yeah. about AI, right? I mean, there was also yeah. a good amount of AI, a healthy dose of AI on the show floor, I thought. But sure. that, that was... That was the reality, but you know, other than that, I think you know a couple of things. I think probably struck you as well. You know, the keynotes that's cleared participation from from the government, right? I mean, you know, um, you know, in terms of the keynotes uh, about you know, um, Mayoka's talking about DHS focus on AI security, whatever that means. Uh, right. Yeah. Right? I mean, <laughs> so I mean, some of that was kind of like just paying lip. I mean. It's more than paying lip service, you know, but, you know, but a lot of it was yeah. organizational, you know, we have this board, we have advisory boards, we have, we're going to be meeting right. you know, regularly, we're going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think yeah. that's pretty cool, right? Um, yeah. Secure by Design, CSUS, you know, Jen Easterly and uh, and Chris Krebs, I think, you know, I, I like some of the approaches. I think that's good. Yeah. Um I think it's important that as an industry, and I'm sure we'll talk about this at the end when we talk about what we would like executives to do, but yeah. I think the nations, I think that the leaders are understanding the importance of cybersecurity, both yeah. in the US and the, and the Western governments, given all the ongoing attacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I still think we're not doing enough, but yeah. at least we're talking about it, and at least it's highlighted on the keynote, and hopefully people are paying attention. Yeah. Yeah, and I like that you're you're sharing your perspectives on the keynote because the keynotes oftentimes, at least from an industry perspective, give you an idea of the mentality and and the priorities that the industry is setting for the year, right? I mean, RSA conference is is a very important conference in the cybersecurity uh, space, and um, one of the things that I thought was very notable. Um, Last year, generative AI was treated kind of like a circus sideshow. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you had folks getting up on stage going, hey, let's ask ChatGPT. We had like zero of that this year. Thank In you. fact, um, I noticed that generative AI was mentioned, uh, wasn't mentioned that maybe once, twice. AI was mentioned, but there was an attitude change. Yeah. Serious attitude change. Nobody talked about generative AI in sort of this casual way anymore. And that I thought was interesting. And then the other thing is uh, last year, there was this thesis that somehow generative AI is going to be this force multiplier for security to help you uh, combat um, existing and emerging cybersecurity threats. And um, I don't think so. And um, you know what? Uh, I think that's an important, very, very important attitude change. I don't think it's a bad one. I think it's mm -hmm. it, it's a recognition of what it is that we're going. The industry is going to cybersecurity industry and practitioners are going to be combating, in uh, you know, in, in this year and then going forward because this stuff is just stacking on top of each other, right? And so, yeah, for me, that was like one of the big changes i mean we can talk in detail about what, what specific things have changed uh, but maybe we'll cover those in our, our takes but um that was super notable for me yeah no i think gen ai it was there i mean i think if you talk to the booths and some of the talks um it was there but you are correct that it's not 
a magic bullet, you know, a, a, a panacea for all the security issues in terms of yeah. investigations or the like. And, and there was use of it to tr in terms of the co-pilot type assistance um, with regard to security products, especially around, you know, uh, saw or XDR where you have a lot of signals coming in and trying to make sense of what's going on. So it can be assistive. But I think um, at least at the booths, when you're talking to people, they are quite careful about what not saying it can do all or just telling you that it's early, we're still working at it. Yeah. At least the ones that I spoke with were at least upfront about, you know, yeah. setting expectations appropriately. But yeah. they're all yeah. using some element around Gen AI, uh, especially when it comes to taking into account of the telemetry, your XDR, NDR, EDR, yeah. NTI, you know, all the acronym yeah. Yeah. alphabet soup on, on the show floor. But but yeah, I mean, it's um, definitely uh, yeah. an interesting evolution um and yeah so i guess we're getting into takes and of course with our takes you know, generative ai takes the <laughs> sort yeah. of takes the headline right i mean that's yeah, always everybody always. has to react to actually it's important because i mean we had ai before it uh, in which is primarily all the you know classical ml stuff um but i guess a lot of the concern there was more in regard to you know the biases and you know potential uh sort of social uh social impact and potential harm that it can impose but when we are, we're looking at generative ai it, it's almost something entirely different but you know i, I do want to uh, take a step back here about ai uh, you know um just like any other conference, everyone kind of uses AI very loosely. Um, some of them refer to AI as meaning specifically generative AI. Others, uh, they use it in a, a broader, uh, broader use, right, or a broader definition. That's correct. And, and one of the things that I, I kept getting reminded by by several uh vendors that i met big and small was that um uh the heavy lifting is done by the all the classical stuff that has already been there and and the uh, I, I actually had a, a several um vendors on the floor tell me generative because i asked them so what's your generative ai story and they would scoff i was like what generative ai story yes. i was yes. like look uh, if you can't do the heavy lifting and, you know, the classical stuff does the heavy lifting, mm -hmm. all this generative chatbots and all this stuff, it's not really going to help. And, you know, it, it's actually something that uh, developers, practitioners, uh, some practitioners, I think practitioners are still on a learning curve with all this stuff. But some of the vendors who've been messing around with uh, a, a lot of the, you know, with transformers, as well as, you know, the different types of uh, you know, generative AI applications that you can build, whether it's a large language model based or diffusion, whatever, um, they're, they seem to have um, tuned into what the limitations and fit for purpose criteria are for uh, these systems. And in fact, uh, largely, when I went, just like you, I went to uh, many of the big vendors, small vendors, yep. uh, I, you are absolutely correct. They were cautious. They were very cautious. In fact, they didn't put it front and center. They didn't put their chat bot front and center. It was like, literally it's experimental. Yep. Uh, some of the big guys who've been talking about, you know, security X, Y, Z, right. Co-pilots and whatever. Yep. Do it. Yeah, correct. Experimental, experimental, experimental. So this stuff is not big, but one, of uh, you know, um, it, it, there are some clever opportunities. I, I don't think that they have been entirely capitalized on. The only one company that I bumped into that actually had a novel, well thought out um, architectural placement of generative AI was Trellix. And I'm going to be talking to them at, at some sure. point. But um, I, I, let's call it an embedded, embedded gen AI function. Uh, that um, actually could solve a problem and it may be kind of a model for how you actually leverage uh, generative AI to enhance, um, and, you know, your yeah. cybersecurity yeah, absolutely. capabilities. Yeah, I mean, so. absolutely. I think Gen AI with regard to any kind of uh, 
telemetry related, you know, investigation related. So on the SOAR platform side, on the XDR, NDR, NTI, that whole EDR space, yeah. there is definitely value in there. So I do see that that use case in the like like you. I think you know, um, and then and and you're right. I mean, one of the things around security is that machine learning has been used for many years, which is why when Gen AI came along, it was like, okay, yeah, that's one more thing as opposed to oh my god, it's AI, right? So I think that that probably predisposed them to not overreacting for the most part because ML has been in use for, mm. uh, and for many years uh, to detect malware, to look at abnormal behavior, find anomalies yeah. in the traffic. So that's the good thing. But again, Palo Alto Networks came out with their precision AI marketing term, uh -huh. which encompasses both the traditional AI and ML, yeah. as well as some of the generative efforts. And I expect some of the other large uh, providers uh, who are looking to play that platform game, as mm -hmm. uh, as Nikesh has has pointed out early in the year, where where they're like, you know, well, you know, um, we're gonna play that platform game. I think, generally speaking, um, AI is gonna be part of any major platform player, whether it's Palo Alto or Cisco yeah. or Fortinet or Checkpoint, the bigger players. I think that's gonna be an element of that. But but yeah, I think it was definitely. Um, an interesting show. Any any cool demos that you saw on the show floor that you you like particularly? Or, um, oh, man, I don't you're, know. You're interrogating me now. Huh? No, no, I'm not just asking. I was just I was curious because I, you know I walk around and I'm like, yeah. I mean, there was a company I thought it was it was actually a cool demo. It was a cool booth. I thought uh, two. Yeah, companies. yeah. One, um, one was um, oh, a company I called you, Tines. You did this to yourself. <laughs> I, and yes, now. I, yeah, and yes, I, I don't even know. I mean, I did do, they do automation, but I yeah. thought it had a like, nice Scandinavian style booth that was quite differentiated. And then our friends at my friends at Forward Networks had this arcade bar type theme, right? I thought it was kind of neat. Optics, yeah. Optics, Optics is the one that had a nerd wall with all yeah. those collectibles in this giant glass wall on the side. So, I mean, not that I should be looking for those, right? As an analyst, I should be paying attention to the products, but but yeah. yeah. I thought that was visually cool. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, no, I think I, I, I thought, um, I thought that some of the it, it's less about demos; it's more about approaches. Um, mm -mm. That I thought were kind of interesting was you know there's this whole now growing concern about bring your own Gen AI right or AI. Mm -hmm. Uh, concern, right? And because mm -hmm. uh, there was an interesting point that was made by a, 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 a you know an analyst friend of mine, uh, other than you, uh, mm -hmm. that the adoption of generative AI tools, uh, it, you know, by enterprises is relatively low at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. But employees are bringing mm -hmm. these tools mm -hmm. into. Yeah the work environment and that yeah. being kind of uh, similar to what people were doing with uh, smartphones, right? Bring your own device. Correct. I think a lot of people do bring your own laptop, but it was the mobile phone that really created this, um, this thing that we call BYOD um, because, you know, um, people didn't want to really want to carry around. I mean, I remember carrying around three, three cell phones, you know, yep. cell phones yes. back then, yep. right? But then now, um, you know, these clever uses of uh, just, uh, I, I would say, frontline defenses like, um, you know, DLP to uh, try to control some of the access to these, uh, these different types of public, uh, you know, Gen AI tools, uh, that, that I thought was interesting because I, I was really curious okay how is the cybersecurity community looking at getting a handle and control over um the their exposure of their data information and knowledge and ip uh out to uh the public when you have all these employees that are bringing these tools who might not have done do you know diligence on the tools that they're using and what these tools are doing with the data that they, uh, you know, with the engagement with the employee, right? And so, you know, early on, we heard all these issues with like, uh, you know, employees going and putting information in chat GPT, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> corporate IP is uh, part of the corpus of uh, of that large language model. Um, 
you know, um, I think this whole zero trust regime probably has to be applied to generative AI. I know that sounds really unpopular to a lot of people, especially people who are big um, AI evangelists. But I mean, think what we're doing in security, zero trust. But why is generative AI an, an exception, especially when it can have the potential of uh, being pretty, um, pretty detrimental to a, a, a enterprise, right? So yeah. I thought that was yeah. kind of interesting. Yep. You know, a lot of that discussion I had with our friends over at the Cradle Point booth. Yes. You know, and they were yep. showing me some stuff. So, yep. No, I, th I mean, you're, yeah, you're right that, yeah, with the NetCloud platform. I mean, you are right that that a lot of the vendors in there are jumping on the, the Gen AI wagon from both sides, right? Which yeah. is that yeah. use Gen AI for your products to try to improve your usability and then, the other element is how to control access to Gen AI. And you're right that there were demos sort of across the board. You know, if you had some kind of controls on, on your system, whether yeah. it's, you know, secure web get gateways or DLP or CASB yeah. product lines, they had some Gen AI, Gen AI component ranging from allow this allow access to Gen AI yeah. all the way into, let's take a look at, you're right, let's take a look at the content and see if those, yeah. that content's allowed or not. And I mean, it's just another use case of the controls that they have in place, uh, all the yeah. way to enterprise browsers that can yeah. control your access to these services, yes, no. Yeah. Um, and of course the, oh, you can have your own LLM and private LLM services, and we will give you zero trust access to your yeah. own gen private LLM environment. So yeah, I think that was that was also sprinkled throughout uh, all the yeah. different booths that, that I guess we all ran into, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And then um, there was uh, there was a a session by uh, Veronis. Um, there's this gentleman, his name is Brian Becky. He, uh, he uh, great presentation, by the way, anybody, uh, it, it was entitled how to safely deploy AI, but it was, it, it was interesting. Um, I thought his angle is more like on, from a zero trust perspective It's like provide access only if you can trust it and only with uh, uh, give it exposure to sources of data that, you know, are actually generally more public f within mm -hmm the enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big problems, and I've highlighted uh, this at the GTC uh, review that I did or recap that I did, as well as um, the Intel one uh, for vision, uh, there is no fine grained control within the application. And so uh, it's all or literally all or nothing. It's a big, big issue that a lot of people actually haven't been talking about. And um, it's one of those, I, I think it's one of those landmines that's hidden that people are eventually going to step on and they're going to realize, whoa. Um, but there are companies out there that are looking at leveraging uh, generative AI tools, whether it's for enterprise search or knowledge management or what have you. Right. All these use yes. cases we're talking about. That's who are correct. starting to recognize this big limitation. And there is apparently no, um, there's no solution for this yet. And may never yes. be just simply because of the nature of um, large language models, and they're not databases. They're they are not RDBMSs, right? You can't treat them like that. In fact, they're not even search sure. engines in, for the most part, yeah. right? Vector databases have their own issues. That's so these are the things that I think people are going to start to realize. Oh, okay. When you take the, this out of a confidential, uh, you know, out of a lab, basically um, uh, making it securely and safely usable within the enterprise as well as outside of enterprise is very, very tricky. And this is still a learning curve that people are on. I think next year, you're going to see a, 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 a sobering up uh, from, you know, all this Gen AI Kool-Aid drinking uh, at the next um, RSA um, to, you know, 2025, RSA conference 2025, right? Yep. So. Yeah, I think I mean so. So you are right that um, that if you uh, pre-train or you fine-tune with data that's not sort of corporate public, right? Or in other words, available to all people in the, in the corporation, um, that you can run into trouble. So you know, like maintenance field maintenance manual, right? Um, yeah. You know, like user guides, you know, knowledge bases. Those are pretty safe because everyone gets access to those. But if you have any kind of confidential information, you got to be very careful. 
Um, having HR, said that, uh, yeah, yeah, HR and the like, yeah, I would say. But having said that, I think many of the workflows I, I am seeing from enterprise use cases, right? You know, like your Salesforce service nouns of the world, or even um, enterprise search, like a company called Glean, for instance. Mm. They're using the Gen AI on a front end as a summarization engine, right? Mm. They're using it as a HCI, form of HCI, human computer interface. Yeah. Mm. But they're not using the Gen AI for the actual search and query which they're using and leveraging the existing methods for, which mm. have the role-based access control. So I'll give you an example. When, say you're searching for a document, mm. it actually either generates a query using Gen AI or uses existing query mechanisms or rack type, you know, retrieval yeah. augmentation. That's still done using whatever tra traditional methods, respecting the metadata, respecting, you know, their, um, respecting whatever rules are in place. Then once the data is retrieved using the user identity and the rights and privileges, Gen AI again is used to summarize it and to write it in a nicer way. Um, in that situation, you respect the existing controls while yeah. still benefiting from Gen AI. So I'm seeing some workflow to do that, but you are right that it's not benefiting from the richness of being able to fine tune with a set of data that you would have access to. Yeah, in order to yeah. do that, you would need personalized fine-tuned LLMs yeah. for every distinct role in a company. And I think yeah. that's something that people are still trying to wrap their heads around. So you're absolutely yeah. right that there's an angle, there's an element there that haven't been figured out. But at the same time, I am seeing some of those use cases and some of the companies that, that, mm -hmm. that I'm talking to where the workflow itself does respect the boundaries, but obviously you can't make, use Gen AI sort of across the board, right? So there are limitations. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a good point and a, and a so, valid. Yeah, and, and, and there are many different types of RAG architectures, at least That's correct. archetypes. And so, um, but I think these are things that um, are, because, you know, right now, the topic of security is, is you know, you have, like, like you, um, I do research across a wide range of domains. Mm. I get to listen to how people talk about different types of technologies, yeah. the topics yep. of security. There still isn't this, you know, we haven't reached a mature level of, let's say, cross domain awareness about For sure. Yeah. And so, uh, again, I think it's just going to become yeah. uh, a, a bit of a surprise through the course of next year as companies are really looking at uh, trying to release these things into the wild. But then also looking at these different service providers who are coming at their employees and partners and um, uh, vetting uh, the confidentiality, security, of these services because mm -hmm. they are largely unknown, yeah. you know? And then what happens when a, let's say a service provider disappears, right? They go bankrupt or, because mm -hmm. uh, many will, there, there's no doubt, many will. What happens to the model? What happens to the embeddings? What happens to all the, I mean, how did they handle the data? These are all unknowns that I think, you know, with this casual, uh, treatment of generative AI. And uh, actually, here's another take. Mm -hmm. So many people, so many practitioners are talking about the pressure the board is putting on IT to adopt um, generative AI. Yeah. Um, these guys are in tremendous pressure. And I don't mm -hmm. think that uh, my impression is this, is they have not received uh, the opportunity. They haven't been given the opportunity to express entirely what is the risk profile uh, that we're that they might be dealing with as they consider the adoption of generative AI across different aspects of their business. Mm -hmm. So, um, but pressure, pressure, that's what- well, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the pressure. Issue, right? I mean, all, all the boards are asking their executives, you know, what are you doing about X or Y? And that's always been the case, right? You know. What are you doing about AI? What are you doing about ML? What are you doing about Gen AI? And yeah. why are you not doing this? You know, do we have, I think that's, yeah. you know, what are you doing about cloud, right? Are you, are you, are yeah. you, are yeah. you yeah. That, so I feel bad for the, I mean, executives for sure, because they're scrambling um, to, to try to keep up to date. Are we, uh, you know, like with cybersecurity, that's a big thing. Are we secure? Are we not secure? Right. right. What are you doing about cyber? You know, like one of the other themes from the show, I guess was, uh, cyber insurance right it, it's yeah. getting uh you know it's getting more and more difficult to get cyber insurance and, and yeah. purchase that and there's all these 
concerns about the new ways of attack, about ransomware and all. The, I mean, yeah, ransomware. You gotta, yeah, you got to keep worrying about all those things. I think that's that's just the reality that they have to deal with. And and cybersecurity insurance is, is complicated. I mean, again, there are some states like North Carolina and, and Florida. I, I you know what that and they were pointing this out during one of the sessions where, you know, like. You, you can't really sell uh, cyber insurance. You know, why would you write a policy in North Carolina? Because they're not allowed to pay ransomware. <laughs> so, uh, wow. the, they, they can't pay ransom. So it's like, you know, why would you write cyber coverage in North Carolina? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it yeah, doesn't uh, make sense, crazy. right? So, yeah. so, so if you write a policy there and you can't pay, you know, the if you can't pay off the people holding you ransom, then if you write a like a business continuity or interruption policy, you know, it, it could take a while for them to recover, right? And so, again, I don't know what the right answer is, pay, don't pay, but uh, but all, but it is a complicated space, and cyber insurance is going to get a lot more uh, complicated um, as yeah. time goes on. That was one of the other themes that I saw as well at, at RSAC, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then the other thing I, I heard a lot of was how MFA is potentially going to become a... Uh, endangered, endangered species, if not already, uh, largely because of swims, uh, you know, sim swap, and uh, but you know the the um, the exploits are mm -hmm. becoming so pervasive and um, diversified that mm -hmm. it, even this mechanism that w we were all told, hey, you know, make sure you have multi-factor authentication on, is right. now becoming. Um, uh, compromised you know and yeah no you're right consistent and viable uh, security measure and so uh the it, you know the, it's constant right the the it is the, it, is. it the is threat vectors are expanding it is um it is. the impact of these attacks you mentioned ransomware and i, I did hear a lot about that as well especially in the mm -hmm context of crypto become, becoming sort of the currency of ransomware yeah. right but it's great for that's what bitcoin's great for well it's it, it's a key enabler yeah. it's a no, key it is. enabler so everybody who wants to know what is the fundamental value of crypto it is ransomware it enables what Microsoft, I think Microsoft calls it like the uneconomy or whatever, you know, at Build last year, they talked about it, how, uh, you know, the the fastest growing economy in the mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. is yeah. this sort of criminal dark economy, which is only second to the Chinese economy in size, but growing much faster than any country. Yeah. But that, that has to make you think, right? Because a lot of these principles of, let's say, democratized or anonymous things mm -hmm. lends to enabling the, these mm -hmm. types of economies. But I, I thought that was something that clearly came out. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. not only the 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 presentation by uh, Kevin Medina, who's uh, the, the Google. Yep. Um, Mandian. Uh, yep, yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. He's he's there. He made that point actually last year at Bill. So I mean, he's there to scare sorry. people. I, I, Not I Bill. Mean, I'm sorry. At um, the uh, Google Cloud Next. So yeah. I mean, Kevin Mannion. I mean, when he presents, people should get scared, and they rightly so. I think you know. I think just understanding what's going on out there, and you're you're right. I think the difficulty for executives is like, okay. You know what? Tell IT MFA right, and you t realize that there's different types of MFA is not MFA is different classes of M MFA and the ones that are SMS based you're absolutely right sim swaps going to get you so you now you go to app base but is that good enough because there's prom bombing where they just keep flirting you and you hit the wrong thing and they're like oh my god they just had to get through one time right and so yeah. then it comes down to but 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 one thing absolutely I would say that speaking of you know going from the takes with the executives is I'm I, I am Surprised that executives themselves, who actually you're on, you are an exec, senior exec, that you don't necessarily practice or know enough about security hygiene or keep up with the times, you know, to protect yourself and your identities, and then tell your employees to, to do the same. And 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 you're right. I mean, MFA, sure, we shouldn't be using SS, SMS based MFA anymore. That that's dangerous, and we've proven that over and over again. You should be at the very worst of using app-based MFA or using pass keys or any of those yeah. methods. 
or the best yet, I know it's a little bit more complicated is to actually carry around one of those token, one of yeah. those keys, right? Like Generated. the UB key or the Google Titan key, right? You, you should be carrying those. I mean, I, I, I use those. Yeah. Because with that combined with a password manager, you at least can get around some a lot of the basic phishing attacks, a lot of the identity yeah. attacks. But yeah. people don't want to because you got to carry that little key in the pain in the ass, right? And so, yeah. but again, if you're running a Fortune 500 Global 2000 company, you're an executive, you're a target. You should be carrying around that key, right? I mean, yeah. really, right? You're supposed I mean, to say, but. <laughs> but they don't i mean look they don't. and look it i mean a pain in the butt yeah i agree it is a pain in the butt it is but i do i carry those keys around right i carry those i have three of those keys one that back up in the safe and yeah. two that i carry around when i travel and yeah. i mean all execs out there who are leading companies really ought to because they owe it to their shareholders to yeah. do that right yeah. i mean yeah. that's the reality but yeah uh, you know, here we are <laughs> yeah. So, hey, uh, let's talk about uh, what you would want to send out as a message or recommendation to tech leaders and um, business leaders out there based on what you observed at RSA 2000 or conference 2024. Got to make sure that you add that conference in there. Right. Yeah. 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 We've been trained. Right. It's got the yes. RSA C or RSA C. conference. Yeah. Can't drop that C. Um, <laughs> yes. um yeah I, I i would say that you know looking at the, the state of cybersecurity today um and the large numbers of vendors and offers and products out there i, I think the reality is you could buy all the products on the, on the show floor and still get compromised i think that's the reality right i could buy yeah. products from all 600 vendors and still get compromised because there's always a little holes there's always zero days you can't block and yeah. if the nation state decides to target you you're, you're pretty much done for but having said that i would say the couple of things that i think are important which is I, I think a lot of global 2000 fortune 500 still don't practice the necessary security hygiene that we really ought yeah. to they're basic things that we already know that if we took simple steps and executives set the example and employees followed and they make clear they were they were serious about cybersecurity and hygiene i think that would be very very important i think that would go a long way to preventing all these things i think that's one two is i think half very very important is the data at the end of the day your data management your data backup your data your, your disaster recovery offsite on site you know i think that's important because the faster you can recover from an attack, you know, by restoring your data, I think that prevents a lot of, you know, well, that prevents the hold that ransomware attacks will have on you because fundamentally, if you can recover cleanly, I think, and quickly, then you're like, you know what, I'm not going to pay. I just bring my data back. Mm -hmm. But you do need to test that that this, that that uh, policy on an ongoing basis, and actually practice recovery to make sure you can actually do it, and that will show any holes in your system. And then finally, just put basic hygiene in place, right? Your you know you should have to have your basic endpoint protection and basic network protection. And if you don't have the cycle, so the expertise to do it inside, go find a managed security provider that can do it on your behalf and get you the peace of mind. But I think if you do those basic things. Your cyber insurance provider will be happy and buy cyber insurance yeah. when you can, if you can afford it. Because I think those are the sort of the, the basic elements of that. And, and if you're a large company, likely you'll get compromised or breached at some point in time yeah. despite your yeah. best efforts and focus your energy on the ability to recovery and and then you know and prevent and remediation and prevent that from happening yeah. on an ongoing basis. I think that's the new reality today. But that's what I would like to say. I think, you know, based on what I'm seeing. In the state of cybersecurity from RSA C twenty two. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, uh, so I don't know how I follow that up. I guess the only thing that I can add there, I, I mean, I agree with everything you've just outlined for technology and business leaders. I, I would just add that um, having solid security governance, cybersecurity governance, but security governance broader than just cybersecurity, security governance for your enterprise is going to be super important. And, and a lot of that is going to, uh, the efficacy of that governance 
is going to be dictated by mindset, I think. Uh, one of the things that I thought was really disturbing is how boards are putting and uh, business leaders are putting, quote unquote, innovation ahead of security and, um, and privacy. The reason why privacy is so important is that privacy is how you respect other people's data. And that mentality, that mindset is going to dictate how much you actually invest in protecting other people's information, especially your customers as well as your uh, your um, partners. Okay, yeah, you um, I heard so many times about how there are huge security gaps between an enterprise and their partners or their customers. So I, I think the the thinking needs to be expanded beyond just cybersecurity for the enterprise, but more broadly influenced by respect for privacy um, and, and confidentiality. Call it confidentiality for enterprises. The other thing is start looking at trust. Trust infrastructure is something that people are going to talk about in the future because it's not just good enough to protect the perimeter or have a zero trust um, practices in place and designs in place and configurations in place for your cybersecurity, um, uh, you know, tools. It's, it's also about having that secure, trusted infrastructure. And that goes all the way down to the processor uh, on up. And so that's something that uh, I think uh, not only cybersecurity or technology leaders should be mindful of because it might, it, I didn't hear things like confidential computing mentioned a lot. Not so much. Yeah. It was I, just I say, assumed. Yeah. 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 But I think it's important. I mean, it's like generative AI, a lot of this stuff, it was, uh, they were last year, they're talking about a, a lot of stuff that wasn't traditionally related to cybersecurity, but that these types of expansions, uh, need to, I think, happen. Um, otherwise, it, it, you just cybersecurity becomes this isolated thing, and it doesn't uh, help to address the broader, broader threat. And a lot of the threat is digital, right? So, yeah. Um, and then you know, yeah, security first. Put that actually ahead of <laughs> a prerequisite for innovation. <laughs> Because a secure, innovate, insecure innovation is not good innovation. And I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> I think that's a good one. A hell of a lot of pontification right there. But, I mean, you know, I, this is such an important topic for me. That's why I, this is going to be a regular stop every year for uh, Next Curve. Yeah, no, I look forward to seeing you up here every year. Yeah. I, I, well, I, no, I, I'm just going to go just to hang out with you, man. So Yeah, you know what? I, you know, I wouldn't mind. I mean, it's, it's, it's convenient, better than I fly down to San Diego just to see you, right? Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Okay. okay. Nice. <laughs> well, hey, um, Roy, always great to have you on. You know, everyone, thanks for joining uh, this uh, podcast. We really appreciate your listenership as well as viewership. Uh, connect with Roy Choi. Uh, I'm sorry, Roy Choi. Roy Choi is a uh, is a, a chef friend of mine. I went to high school with him. You know, he's the guy that did uh, Bull Go uh, like Gogi, the food truck, and he opened oh. in Las Vegas. Sorry about that, Roy, but. You know, oh, that seems like a better career. Actually. <laughs> He's doing really, really well. I saw him at our, our um, what was it, thirtieth high school reunion? Oh my gosh! Uh -huh. Anyway, um, so yeah, connect with him at, at Avid Think. Um, you know, everyone knows Roy. I hit a I hit both of us up on LinkedIn. We don't bite, and we'd love to hear from you and uh, engage with you on that forum. And uh, please subscribe to our uh, podcast, which will be featured on the Next Curve YouTube channel. Uh, check out the audio version on Buzzsprout and find out uh, where we're located in your favorite podcast platform. Just, you know, type in uh, Next Curve Rethink and also subscribe to the Next Curve Research Portal at www.next-curve.com for the tech and industry insights that matter. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, Roy. No, thank you, Leonard. Always a pleasure to speak with you. And thanks for having me on. <laughs> it's always fun. All the time. Take care. Thank you.